Sure, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Louise. Uh, I am from ARI, which is part of the Victorian Government's um, Environment Department. And there I work in a team that works on uh, threatened fauna. I mostly work on forest dependent species, which often sees me working on gliders and possums. Um, but tonight I'm going to talk about um, this frog, which has captured my interest uh, a lot the past couple of years in particular. Let's throw you what's tonight. I batch the talk simply updates from the field, uh, partly because I have to give a title before I make the talk, and partly uh, because it's going to be a whole mixed bag of things. I'd like to try and tell the story of this frog in Victoria over the past few years. Uh, so it's going to be a real summary of several different survey programs, um, updates on kitchen results, genetics results, acoustic monitoring results, with a few anecdotes from the field thrown in. Uh, and I should also acknowledge that this work I'm going to summarise is uh, sort of been a collaborative effort from a whole group of people over a number of years. Um, most recently, some of the genetics work I've been working on has been from these people. Carlo Pagiani is our resident geneticist or molecular ecologist at ARI. Rena Gavrov has been instrumental in the What's Nice story, lives out in East Gippsland um, and has put a lot of her own time into this. And Matt West has helped us in the field a lot and with the acoustic data as well. Okay, so just to start us off and get our bearings about what species we're talking about here because there's been a bit of change in the last couple of years. A couple of years ago, uh, Professor Mike Marnie from the University of Newcastle uh, and his colleagues published this paper and it split the species that we had known as the Toria Lutonae into two species. Um, one which retained the name Latoria Littlejohnai after Frogs Victoria's own patron, Murray Littlejohn, uh, which is now known to be distributed in the Sydney uh, Basin bioregion. So the red symbols on the map, don't worry about the numbers, just pay attention to the colours. And a new, previously unrecognised species, given the name Latoria Watsonai, um, after Dr. Graham Watson, frog researcher from the University of Melbourne. And the current state of knowledge is that we've got Watson and I distributed from the Wollongong region uh, down south on the coastal side of the Great Divide in southeastern New South Wales into far east Gippsland in Victoria. You might note that there's a bit of a gap here in the distribution of uh, Latoria Watson and I, about 200 k's from sort of the latitude of the ACT down to the big border. Uh, there are a couple of historical records here, these little black dots which are apparently legitimate. There are museum specimens to match, but um, they were from the 1970s and we're unsure if the species still occurs there today. The picture shows, um, the picture's from the paper and it shows, um, we've got Little John I on the left, frogs A, B and C, and Watson I on the right, frogs D, E and F. So that paper found are actually divergent genetically, which was the basis for their split and re-description, the description of what's nine. And they have just some minor differences in their morphology and call rate. But those differences are so subtle that if you've got one in the hand, the main way to know if you've got a what's nine or a little guy is simply geographic location. <coughs> So we've got all Victorian uh, records of Little John I are now ascribed to uh, Watson I. This is species was known uh, by the common name the large brown tree frog in Victoria, um, which is a pretty uninspiring name for a pretty interesting frog. Uh, so since the redescription, a lot, of, a lot of people have been starting to call it Watson's tree frog. Um, you'll see that on a lot of the um, uh, papers and talks that are coming out now, which is probably a more appropriate name. In New South Wales, they call it the heath frog, so there's a few different names floating around for these guys. Um, I'm just going to roll with Victoria Watson Eye for the time. Okay, so Watson Eye is now one of seven recognised species in the Victoria Ewing Eye group, or species complex. And in the same area as it occurs, we've also got a couple of other species in that group, Victoria Ewing Eye and Victoria Vero Eye. 
Uh, but you can easily distinguish what's an eye from those two species in that area by its relatively larger size and by the bright orange colouring on the back of the legs in the groin and the armpit area. The other really interesting thing about this frog is their smell. So sometimes when you when you have the adult in the hand, when you're handling them, they get a little bit stressed and they might put out this um, like an exudate from their skin and it smells just like curry powder. Like it's uncanny. Everybody I've seen hold one, they go, oh god, it's so good. I've actually brought along a container of curry powder so you can <laughs> close your eyes and smell it and imagine yourself holding a laboratory one time. It's just like that. It's crazy. Um, okay, so they're a forest dependent species, entirely forest dependent. They've never been recorded outside of forested areas or cleared areas. And since February of this year, they have been formally listed as an endangered species nationally under federal legislation and are listed as critically endangered in Victoria under their previous naming of that was right the night. Okay, uh, in Victoria, it's always been known to be rare. There's only about 48 records in Vic um, accumulated over the course of the 20th century. Uh, until about 1996, after which there were no more records for 19 years. And it was feared that this species might be extinct in this state. And that was until one night in 2015 when uh, ecologist Rena Gabarov, who I mentioned earlier, she was out doing some glider surveys for a different project in East Gippsland near Bone, and she heard a frog call and she recognised it to be different. I'm going to play the draw so you know what it sounds like. Uh, survey program targeting what's nine was in 2017. 
and it was Lucas Bluff, the event, uh, Delphine Bansdale, who led the design of that program, and he built a species distribution model, which helped us to direct survey efforts to the most likely parts of the landscape where you can find open coppers, because the most suitable habitat most likely to find the frog. Uh, and after he did that, field teams from Wildlife Unlimited went out and drove all the tracks in those areas, searching for potential breeding sites, places like the ones I showed you on the side of the road, all standing by the water. Um, they focused their effort on the roads, road network simply because they wanted to cover the maximum amount of um, area in a small amount of time. Uh, so they identified 662 of those potential breeding sites, uh, which are shown by the little black crosses on the map, which basically follow the road network in that area. Uh, and they returned at night to survey them with standardised periods of listening for the frog, call playback, and uh, spotlight searching. And when you play the calls at a, at a spot and there's a what's nigh there, they usually straight away they'll call back to you if they're going to call at all. So all of those places were visited at night under suitable conditions. There was a bit of work done as well around um, the detection probability. So, um, so these days we've got survey guidelines so that you only ever attempt a what's nice survey under certain environmental conditions that will maximise your chance of encountering the frog, assuming that it's there. So they were all surveyed in spring and autumn of that year, some of them twice which resulted in a total of 21 new sites with detections of the frog, shown by the blue triangles on the map. Uh, it was a pretty low detection rate though, only 3.2% of the sites that were surveyed ended up with um, a confirmed detection of the frog. And notice that the area with the blue triangles is smaller than both the area surveyed by the crosses and the area with the historical record. A couple of years later, another big broad-scale survey was done, this time expanding the search area to the east and the west, shown by the black crosses, uh, North Buckin and between Cam River and Mallacoota. Um, those are areas that the models were telling us, you know, potentially have suitable habitat as well. Uh, and that year we had significant new detections over here, northeast of Tan River. The last one, the only one actually in the past from over there was the early 90s record from Grand Plastic. Uh, but overall, they were only detected at 9 out of 658 sites, so detection rate of 1.4%, which seems to um, suggest that they are patchily distributed across this landscape despite the fact that there is apparently contiguous habitat between all of these sites. Uh, they appear to occur at low densities and their range in Victoria seems to have contracted relative to historical levels. And then, as we all know, before those surveys were even finished, the black summer bushfires burnt through extremely large tracts of the East Gippsland forest landscape including 85% uh, of the habitat, the modelled habitat, for uh, this tree crop. And half of that was at high to very high severity. There have been a couple of survey rounds uh, since that time, uh, neither of them as big as these ones, but um, checking on the few dozen known sites where we knew we had the frog tree fire, and putting the results of those two surveys together, this is just a really basic view of which sites have had what's an eye post fire. So we visited most of the sites, 39 of the sites um, have had at least one survey in the past couple of years. Uh, and of the 30 burnt sites, 18 of them or 60% have had at least one what's an eye detection. Uh, of the nine unburnt sites, 78% of them, seven of them have had um, what's an eye detection in the same time period. Uh, and these are some of the sites pictured at the bottom here. So these are all what's nice sites that you know we knew had the frog up until right up until the fire happened. And they obviously saw a really high intensity canopy consuming fire. You go there and there's there's no canopy cover, it's really bright, it's really exposed. Um, they have all had what's no breeding post fire. I was really surprised to rock up to this one especially. This forest was quite young when it was burned. Um, and to see these tadpoles swimming around in this puddle on the side of the road was 
like amazing. Uh, but how do we interpret this? Um, clearly, you know, things like that, it clearly has some resilience to fire. Um, it's able to withstand the direct impacts of fire at least some of the time, at least to some of the frogs. But the indirect or hidden impacts um, are not yet clear and are quite uncertain. And they include things like loss of shelter sites for the frog, loss of canopy, potentially increasing the uh, evaporation of the small water bodies that they depend on for breeding, uh, increased sediment load running off the burnt slopes into their culverts. That culvert now is completely silted up and does not have water in it anymore. Potentially unrecognised genetic impacts from population bottlenecks, uh, and of course the cumulative impact of repeated fires at the same location. And the only way of knowing really if these things are actually causing issues for persistence of the frog will be ongoing monitoring. I'm also going to mention uh, DELP's pre-harvest survey program, um, now called the Forest Protection Survey Program. So this is a big and active survey program uh, now in its fourth year and it sends ecologists out into the field uh, looking for, surveying for threatened species in coops or blocks of forest that are planned for harvest in state forest. So this map shows the same part of East Gippy uh, where lots and I occurs and all of these little shapes are coops that are currently on the timber release plan. And if you can make it out, the yellow highlighted ones are ones that have received dedicated survey effort for what's and I in the past two years. So my point here is not to get into a discussion about the extent of timber harvesting in East Gippsland, but to point out a couple of things that I think are relevant to the what's and I story. And the first one is that uh, this is the first big survey program in the past few years that has been sending people away from the road network specifically looking for what's an eye. So sending people deep into the bush, looking for these potential breeding sites. Uh, the survey effort is three days, or three nights after the potential breeding sites have been identified. Three nights of traditional boots on the ground frog surveys, as well as four weeks of uh, acoustic monitoring. So, you know, they've, they've covered a lot of ground. This has really increased the search effort. Uh, and the second point is that about 35 coops a year have been prioritised for Watson Eye surveys. In about four years, it's around about 140 coops that have been surveyed in this way. And in all of that time and all of that effort, Watson Eye has only been detected at six coops out of about 440 coops. So uh, further evidence that they do appear to be thin on ground. Alright, I'm going to have a couple of uh, slides here about the Kittred story as far as we know so far. Okay, I probably don't need to introduce Kittred, but suffice to say Kittredia mycosis is the disease that uh, is uh, caused by a fungus that infects the skin of the frogs and is responsible for a lot of uh, frog declines and extinctions around the world and in Australia. Okay. Uh, the red squares on the map show what's and I sites with at least one positive uh, detection of kitchen, and the green squares show sites that are so far kitchen free. So this is the first evidence really that we've got kitchen present in the range of what's and I from east to west all the way across. Nine out of 32 sites so far sampled have had at least one, um, have returned at least one positive kitchen result. So yeah, positive east to west. We do have an area in the north of the range, which is actually the higher elevation sites, where uh, in the Snowy National Park and the northern parts of Erinundra National Park, that were kitchen free at the time of testing. Two outlier sites that we discovered in 2019 have both returned kitchen positive results, including at one of them uh, last autumn, the observation of sick, dead and dying frogs uh, at one of these sites. All of them returned kitchen positive swabs and uh, with a really high zoo spore load. Not what's an eye frogs, frog species other than what's an eye, but other what's an eye 
outside. Uh, I should stress that the sampling has been really sporadic. It's quite rare to encounter a Watsonite and swap it. Some of these are, yes, absolutely swaps of other frogs at Watsonite sites. So sampling has been quite sporadic. It's a bit of a snapshot. Um, this is also uh, accumulated data over a number of seasons, and it's likely a really dynamic picture, a dynamic situation of disease dynamics across the landscape. But it's the first confirmed as an evidence that we've got that chytrid is present in this area and it is affecting frog species in this part of Victoria. Okay, I'm going to share a story now from Rena in East Gippsland with her permission. Uh, this here is the log, the spot that's become known as the log. Um, it's in Martins Creek for a fauna reserve and it's one of the more reliable sites for what's my breeding over the past few years. The frog that was on the title slide and in the promo stuff was photographed here in the log. Okay, it was burned by a high severity bushfire in 2014, the Goomer and Denver Trail bushfire, and then it was burned again in 2019-2020 bushfires. After the 2014 fire, this tree was deemed a hazardous tree and was felled from the roadside, so this site is, you know, two metres off the road. Um, and since that time, it's held in this pond of water, rainwater, in the log, almost constantly. And it often has dozens of Watsonite capitals in it. Uh, when was it? November 2020, the water in the log nearly dried up. There were Watsonite capitals in it at the time, and the decision was made to salvage those capitals from the wild into captivity under a uh, wildlife care permit until, um, until they developed into little frogs and could all return to the wild. So it was only a couple of months before the first cohort, uh, uh, sure enough, turned into little frogs and they were uh, put back at the lock. So that was fine. The next couple of tadpoles to turn into little frogs were held on to for a little bit longer in captivity because it was a little bit colder then to release them in the sport. And they both died before they could be released, which started ringing some alarm bells. At the same time, we started swabbing adult frogs at the log and we started swabbing the tadpoles in captivity. And all of them were found to be chytrid positive. So it turns out this site is a chytrid positive site. The tadpoles in captivity were chytrid positive. This is a problem because as soon as they turn into uh, little frogs, they are likely to die. And so Rita and Joe at Wallabia Wildlife Sanctuary sought some advice about what to do about this. You know, could they treat the little frogs? Uh, I think they spoke to people at Toronto Zoo, Zoo Victoria, and got some really good advice from Laura Brennelly at Melbourne Uni. Um, and as soon as the frogs were turning to little metamorphs like these guys here, they were kept in quarantine, sterilised housing, treated for chytrid um, over a simple of treatment. And one testing was found to be negative. Six weeks later, a second negative test um, confirmed the remarkable achievement, I think, that uh, they were successfully treated for chytrid, um, which is the first time this has been done for this species. The next problem really was where to release them. Uh, there was some understandable hesitance to put them back at the log, which is now known to be a chytrid positive sign. After all that effort to clear the little guys of chytrid. So they went through a consultation process with the local biodiversity staff and I think there were some conditions in the permit which allowed them to uh, release those frogs at the nearest future free what's in my site, which is 18 kilometres away from the lot. And that was done in March of this year. Uh, and at that time, not these guys exactly, but um, it's just like them, they metamorphosed I think it was 14, 15 and 16 months after they were collected from the lot. It was quite a long time. There are still tadpoles in captivity with Rena and Joe. They're now 18 months old at least. And they still haven't turned into the frogs when they were swimming around and maybe they will. But that is a very, very long time to be a tadpole. Okay, um, we're going to talk about the results of uh, a recent project that we did over the past couple months looking at genetic 
diversity and population structure. Okay, this was a uh, this was a piece of work to inform a bigger project, DELT's uh, genetic risk index, which uh, is something that DELT is doing to try and rank over a thousand different species and incorporate genetic information into conservation management. So things like uh, identifying candidate species for genetic intervention, management intervention, things like genetic mixing, genetic risk rescue, uh, moving into potentially moving individuals from one part of a species uh, range into another part to bolster genetic diversity. So we had a pretty constrained uh, sampling window for this. We went out in autumn of last year. We had um, a bit of trouble actually finding enough, finding many at all out of frogs uh, during the time frame of that project. So we didn't have much time and we had to do it at not the most optimal time of the year. So we couldn't find many animals. Here's Rena and Danny uh, collecting some tadpoles from one of the sites on the side of the road. Um, and we had a few other issues with DNA yield. But long story short, we ended up with 87 samples submitted for sequencing and we're really fortunate actually it was a happy coincidence that at the same time uh, there was a PhD student Sarah Scott from the University of Newcastle who's working with my Marnie uh, who is doing her PhD on among other things the diversity genetic diversity of birds and I in New South Wales and so we were able to collaborate with them and share our data and um, you know, it's been really valuable to be able to compare the Victorian story with the Mondays uh, and over the border and the rest of their distribution. Uh, the extracted DNA was sequenced at Dart in Canberra, which generated a huge data set of uh, SNPs. And I'll show a few results slides. So these are uh, principal component analysis plots or PCA plots. And they show how uh, all the different uh, samples from the final data set work together or work apart according to how the demand is similar, similar or different data. And one of the main results of the study was that all of the Victorian samples, which I have here in the group, they work together to form a really distinct cluster that is well separated from the other Portsmouth uh, populations in these subways. So here are those um, populations, I'll just bring up the map again. So the New South Wales North and South cluster were identified in the Marnie paper a couple of years ago. And then the Victorian cluster, circled in blue at the bottom, is the data from last year. You might notice that there is a little green dot in the big cluster over here. Uh, geographically, we were calling that New South Wales South. But actually, it's just over the border there from the from the in Nagy and New South Wales. So it kind of makes sense that it's, it's geographically and now we know genetically works with the Victorian cluster. There's two takeaway things about this. Oh yeah. So I'm told that the Victorian um, what's called they are so different. Looking at this view of the data, this is sort of like from the uh, whole genome SNPs data for the nuclear DNA. This view of the data has the Victorian what's known more different from the New South Wales what's known than the New South Wales what's known are for the little data, the other species. Which has led to some really interesting conversations around whether or not we might actually be dealing with uh, an unrecognised species or subspecies or evolutionary significant. But our working hypothesis actually is that this is probably the effect of genetic drift, which can happen when you've got a small population that is uh, really isolated from other populations and has no genetic diversity. Um, the alternative is we might actually have to do some taxonomic work, but for now we're assuming that this is a genetic drift. Uh, but yeah, the takeaway here is that we are very isolated from the most vast populations with no genes going between them. Uh, this is a genetic tree based on mitochondrial DNA. 
Since these numbers change a little bit, but whichever way you look at it, it came out something like this. So the New South Wales Northern Cross Star is in the hundreds of uh, individuals in the affected population size. New South Wales South is around about 60, which is low. And Victoria is really low numbers, between 3 and 21. So, um,
10 seconds, and the break of the one 10 seconds. I recently received some data for 2020 that I haven't had a chance to look at yet. And this year we have tried to really ramp it up. Um, so 34 sites have been monitored. Yeah, as I said, even though we have no dedicated funding, the team out in East Auckland, the Northern Ireland State, the Southern Ireland program have been helping us around all the problems and picking them up again. So they're due for a retrieval next month. So I don't have a full picture yet. About, I was out there a few weeks ago and managed to talk about the cards and nine of them. And out of those nine, one of them on the ground, two of them have got snow cones on them. So that's in the five or six months, so we have one three, and only two of those nine have got snow cones on them. Uh, which is a bit disappointing because there are no hot snow sites. Most of the hot snow sites have had them once and have not yet seen them, even though we've been filming each other and we're still making them. And I will just tell a little anecdote about this guy. Um, this is an adult male, what's he like? He lives at the time, he's in the middle of the And that is probably the most reliable place in the world to probably talk about to you. So he can play what's he like with that. And the reader has often remarked to me, oh, he's got this one male, you know, this one male by himself at this spot. He's the only one who makes it so good. Um, and I've always been a bit skeptical, you know, because we don't know that, we're not, we're not individually marking them. Um, but there's a couple of recent just anecdotes that I want to think about them. And the first one is that we visited this spot in November last year, last spring, to get a genetic sample. Sure enough, we made a call and he calls back to me and we're going to go in and we're going to get a biopsy and we're going to go in. And then a few weeks ago in March, I went back there to swap out the card. And it was not time, so I thought I might as well try and play the problem. Sure enough, he calls back to me and we find him in the undergrowth next to the tunnel. And I thought, oh, this is the spot, there's another male. I'm like, oh, great, we've got another tissue sample. And so I'm looking at his food and the moment it's been to start to shoot, and I don't really want to be the more I looked at it, I thought, I was like, oh, there's a lot of things that I've never done with that recently. So, I was the same guy. And then I looked at the uh, what we wanted to do, the autistic data. Most of the time, if you've got what's known for you, you've got what you might be called a small forest, or maybe you've got to the whole world or something. But night after night for four months, we went to the nine, four, five months, it's just this one guy. We may actually And I will just mention quite a great that it's going to be much easier. Uh, we're really late because the data has actually been 2019 that first year we did it. It's not like that way still. Um, we have identified and tagged about 300,000 what's my calls, which have been used as training data for a new model that we're developing in AI. It's a deep learning model.
the survey tool or a sampling tool. These frogs are extremely cryptic and, uh, and can be quite thick. They'll be there one night, but not there the next night, even though you know they're there because they're there. So it will be great to uh, be able to take it in the Research for the special ecology is sorely needed. It's something I looked at. I mentioned in a lot of um, management documents going back to the years. Um, so we would like to be sorry if we potentially explore experimental manipulation of the water in the tunnels, or um, preferably as a first step in a controlled environment with captive frogs. We don't have any captive frogs at the moment, um, but I hear that Liz Victoria may have plans for a captive insurance population at some point in the territory. I think I'll leave it there, but I just want to acknowledge that all of these people and organisations have been instrumental in driving all of this work forward. So thank you.